Hello, good evening. I'm so delighted to welcome you to Freelance Futures. My name is Sandeep Mahal. I'm Director of Sector Change at People Make It Work. I'm a 44 year old brown woman with long dark hair and I'm going to be chairing this session this evening on organisational activism, human rights versus human resources and we'll be hearing from an amazing group of speakers who have taken human centred approaches to HR practice. I'm going to start by saying a little about People Make It Work, uh, the Freelance Futures programme we have helped to create, and then we'll open up the discussion with our fantastic panel of speakers. Um, first of all, though, um, I, should, I want to talk about People Make It Work, which exists to help cultural organisations and leaders to change and develop. Um, we're made up of a community of freelancers, and we sit in service to you all and the brilliant work that you do. Um, this evening's event is part of Freelance Futures, um, a summer programme of learning and action for equitable conditions in culture. And we're actively committed to an inclusive programme. So before we go further, I just want to outline access and other important information. Um, so this evening, Andrew Howell is our live captioner. And to access captions, you can click on the CC closed uh, caption button on your screens. And there is also a link, which means you can have it open in another browser. And we will put that in the chat now. Um, we also have a BSL interpretation this evening, uh, and of course that will be embedded in the recorded version. Abby Jones is providing the BSL interpretation today, and we will ensure their image is pinned so they are viewable at all times. Now, Freelance Futures is a call for collective learning and action to build equitable conditions for freelancers working in culture. We know it will take all our efforts to affect real change. So we welcome all your insights and experiences as independent practitioners, um, as practitioners working within cultural organizations, unions, um, funding bodies and policymakers. And given that this action will need all of us, this is our basic code of conduct for today. Please respect and value your collaborators in this room. Be aware of your privilege, when to make space and when to take space. Avoid overcomplicated language and explain any technical terms. And of course, we are all at different stages in our learning. So we ask you to respect the person and to challenge the idea. This is a relaxed environment and it is being recorded in order that people can watch this panel whenever it is convenient for them to do so. So feel free to access this event in any way that makes participating work for you. If possible, start with your video options switched on so you can view the speakers and contributors, but we understand that that might not work for you. And finally, in terms of this panel discussion, we wanted to say we are recording the session for others to access throughout the Freelance Futures programme. Um, so the panel will feel a bit more like a broadcast. If you do want to talk to each other or explore ideas, then we have created a social platform, Mighty Networks, oh. where you can access that from the community link from the Freelance Futures website. And we'll pop the link to that in the chat. So having described that bit, I am now delighted to introduce the speakers who will help us to explore this tension between human rights and human resources and the organisational shifts they have enabled to create more human-centred, equitable employment conditions. So can we start by going round and inviting each, each speaker to give an audio description and an introduction to your role, organisation and practice? And I would love to start with Stella. Stella, would you like to start and then kindly nominate the next speaker? Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm Stella Conu. I am a fine looking black woman in front of a picture with a pink, t a pink shirt on, um, sitting at a chair with a window to my uh, left. And um, I am currently the executive director at LIFT, London International Festival of Theatre, and I'll hand over to Tom. Hello, I'm Tom. I'm an average looking 37 year old white man with uh, light brown hair and a blue shirt and glasses. I'll hand over to Zana. 
Thank you. Hi, I'm Zanna. Uh, until recently, I was the artistic director, CEO at Pavilion Dance Southwest, and I'm now uh, an independent consultant uh, working with leaders and organisations who want to make positive change. Uh, I have, uh, I'm a, an older white woman with glasses with a thick rim. I have grey shoulder length wavy hair and I'm wearing a bright green top against a blurred background. And over to Richard. Thank you, Zanna. Zanna, I don't know if you mentioned your gorgeous glasses, um, which deserve a mention anyway. They're beautiful and kind of, are they violet? That's a very beautiful colour. I'm Richard Watts. I'm a 53-year-old white man. Um, I'm wearing clear-rimmed glasses. I've got um, short, some say balding, grey hair. And I'm sat at home in my husband's chair because he's at work. Back to you, Sandy. Thank you. Thank you. What a fine looking room. Thank you so much for joining us. And we are very sorry to announce that immigration and employment barrister Eva um, Dua is dealing with an urgent human rights uh, immigration case in court um, this evening. So she won't be able to join us for this conversation, but Richard will share insights garnered from his conversation with Eva. And we look forward to, to that conversation. Um, so to explain how this panel discussion is going to work, um, we are going to explore together two themes. Um, the first theme is about how cultural organizations are making those fundamental shifts to create more positive, supportive, equitable conditions for all workers, including freelancers. And the second theme will explore the opportunities to reshape, redefine policies and practices that counter the hostile environment and unfair barriers faced by migrant workers. So if I can invite Zana um, to tell us a bit about the work that you've introduced at Pavilion and the, and the process that you went through of um, interrogating the leadership model there and your approach to um, involving freelance cultural workers in, in that process. Thank you, Sandy. Yes. Um, so as I said, until, in fact, until two weeks ago, um, I was leading a dance organization called Pavilion Dance Southwest. Uh, it has a theater and two studios in Bournemouth and it's on the south coast of England. During my time there, I, I shifted the organizational culture so that it was led by our values. Uh, it empowered workers. And I began to adapt to the organization to the future workplace. Um, I myself have experienced frustrations uh, with a very rigid HR approach from, you know, from baffling contracts to uh, brutal dismissals and, uh, and from a working culture of fear where people don't feel they can speak up or speak out. Uh, I made some changes which made our ways of working much more flexible and personal, uh, but they still existed within a, a legal HR framework. Uh, there were a few experiences or programs which defined the need for change for me. Um, one of them was Surf the Wave, uh, which I can see some of you here uh, attended. It was a three year program looking at how to change the showcasing and touring of small scale dance in the UK. 458 people uh, came to different events through it and the vast majority were freelancers. They were freelance professional choreographers dancers and producers. Part of the programme included uh, challenging discussions about equity and where power lay, and there was a strong desire to tear down the structures that held the power and make new, more equitable ones. And there was an urgency that change had to happen, it had to happen now. Uh, and I came away from that programme really sure that we had to take action and we had to involve freelancers more in positions of influence uh, and to recognise that if we could give freelancers a chance to be part of the whole organisation part time, that maybe that gives them uh, all sorts of things, you know, an insight to organisational working, the power to influence how an organisation works, useful experience, but also um, some stability and some financially. Um, we also we hosted two change makers uh, in my time there. Uh, they were from marginalised communities. Uh, and they challenged and advised us on how to be more inclusive. 
So Natasha Player's focus was with African, Caribbean and Indian communities. And Kathy Waller's was with disabled people and particularly people with invisible disability. Natasha and Kathy ran all staff sessions and they worked across the artistic programs, the building, our marketing, organization policies and recruitment. Um, and I learned so much from them uh, and we made changes as, as a re result of their interventions. And lastly, um, I set up a critical friends equality group um, of freelancers and independent organization representatives. Uh, they met once a year and they created a blueprint of what they wanted to see from PDSW. Uh, it was open hands, see ourselves uh, and hold uh, open doors. So open doors, hold hands, see ourselves. And we applied these reminders uh, across everything that we did. So um, here are some of the key changes that people told me made a real difference to them. Um, the first is um, to welcome and check in. So, you know, at the start of a contract, um, we made sure that there was time allowed for introductions. So new people met other people and they felt part of what they were doing. Uh, and then there were regular check-ins to see, you know, how's it going? Uh, is the contract covering their costs and time? Uh, what about timescale? How's that going? Can things be shifted if needed to, to help them achieve um, the work better or within a timescale that works for them? Um, and interestingly, this really worked with staff as well. So we began to do the same thing with staff as well. Um, and I really believe that everyone should have regular check-ins. And that includes the leaders of the organisations, actually. So then the second thing would be um, we introduced an access budget. And that's, um, that really supported all kinds of costs, from childcare to different kinds of interpretation, uh, from equipment um, to a support worker. And um, we decided to keep it as a dedicated line so we could start to see how much we needed in the future um, to support access. Um, so it was a new line in the budget uh, and that will be monitored going forward. So we get a real sense of every year how much we should be thinking about across the whole organisation for access needs. Um, we really tried to remove barriers uh, and we did that by as soon as we had the first discussion, interview, chat with somebody, we asked um, about, we talked about the work, obviously, but we asked if there was anything that we could do to make them feel more confident in how they delivered it or make more able to deliver it to their best ability. Um, so there, I guess, we had to listen to what they um, asked for or, or what they referred to. And then we, there was a discussion about how we could address um, what they had identified. Uh, and many people said it was the first time they'd been asked that. Um, so something simple to do, but it made a massive difference to setting them on a path to be able to be their best selves delivering that work um, and it, it really I guess we had to have open discussions and we had to be up for changing things you know they couldn't necessarily be the way that we thought they might, might be. Um, the fourth point I would say is um, I'm really really keen on working in twos so when we work with people particularly if they are from underrepresented communities making sure that there are always at least two people um, and the, uh, these people will be representing experiences or views, and um, we really need to make sure that they don't feel exposed or vulnerable. Um, and I had experiences where we didn't do that well. So over time, I introduced um, policies to try to ensure that we did it better in the future. Um, so that goes from board members, uh, whether it's your young trustees or other members of the board, um, whether it is um, new animateurs coming in, um, always having to provides a buddy it provides a support and it means no one person is expected to represent a whole community um, and lastly um the 360 self and i guess this is very much the person-centered approach you know it's accepting that every individual is a whole person and they bring all of their self into their workplace so this may mean that at times things are faster or slower that they're happier or sadder um, and really for that, we had to apply empathy, listening and, and be prepared again to shift things if they were needed to keep um, to enable people to keep a balance and keep on track. We introduced an employee assistance programme, which provided confidential support, not only for our employees, 
but um, I think it was six hundred pounds for um, forty employees, but it was only a thousand pounds for sixty, and that included um, the freelancers we worked with regularly. Provides all sorts of support from you know debt relief advice to um, work practices to emotional mental health counselling. Um, so I really recommend that. And we've had it's confidential, so I don't know who's used it unless they told me. But I had feedback that it was a positive thing to provide confidential support to people. So in 2020, um, I wrote a piece um, titled "Reflections on a More Equitable Future," and it talked about where we were as an organisation and what we were doing to achieve faster change. And I concluded that intersectionality will form the bedrock of our person-centered approach, allowing people involved in PDSW to be who they are and bring their unique perspectives to influence what we do. Uh, when I left, I'm really happy to say that the organization is on that path. Uh, it's a journey that will never stop. We all need to change we always need to listen uh, and we need to change things uh, but that path has begun that journey has begun um, and those are just a few of the key changes we made so I hope something there might have been um, useful to you and thank you for listening thank you Sana I'm feeling so inspired by that that provocation um, and the important message that this is a practice there's all, there will always be a need to change. There's always a need to listen and it's a journey. Um, and it feels like um, a really, uh, a process that's been brought about by um, interrogating the alignment of your values with your practices um, and, and demonstrating the value of uh, freelancers, um, the value that they generate and the impact that, that, ha that has had in shaping um, your, your current and future models and practices. Thank you so much. Um, Stella and Tom, uh, I'm wondering if Zana's own journey um, and practice is, is familiar or reflective of your own experience of the changes you've made internally um, to hosting, um, paying and contracting freelancers. Um, would you like to share? Absolutely. I mean, I think there is a real mirror there in terms of some of the solutions, but maybe the roots of kind of um, and the agitation that has uh, forced us to kind of really look at and review what we're doing and maybe slightly different. And I would say that there's probably three kind of influences in terms of how Lyft has um, kind of entered this kind of space and arena. Um, and some of them will be familiar with, you know, and similar to other organisations in that there is the kind of pandemic and the kind of the whole sway of this movement from things being a, around about people and not product and the space that that kind of created. Um, and, then, and then I think there's also something about um, the advocacy that freelancers, the self advocacy that freelancers engaged in during the pandemic, where it became a, almost a tap on the shoulder for all of us organizations, where, um, you know, a lot of what um, freelancers were talking about, whether that was through freelancers make work or in London, we had the um, creative freelancers shaping london's recovery which was a program of 50 organizations working to think about what the recovery would look like from a freelancer's perspective and all of that kind of didn't uncover this need for innovation it was this need for basic things that we were missing and those things have kind of been real influences and i guess where the similarity for lyft and what zana was talking about is around values and for me the point isn't really starting from the values per se it's more about the emergence over the last five years around heart leadership and the fact that we're moving away from this kind of brain focused brawn leadership that has dominated the landscape for the last few decades where we're now looking at what drives you know a heart leadership that is about people but it's also moving away from a kind of harshness to a, a softness that allows for that vision of um humanity 
It allows and not product and not labor. And it's really difficult to unpick the connection, especially when we're talking about freelancers, the weight of labor within organizations and how it's valued and how freelancers have been valued in this space um, according to the labor that they can provide. But the disruptor of the kind of the pandemic and the voice that we started to hear from freelancers is beyond the labor is this um this this humanness this and our basic needs are not kind of being met and so those are the kind of influences that enabled us at lyft to kind of really review some of our practices and this is where um, Zana, we really align a lot in terms of the approach that we've taken. And there are probably five areas for me that we've kind of explored. And they, they're almost like part of the journey of a freelancer into an organization. And firstly, for me, it's been around recruitment and changing all of those practices, being more open to freelancers who might want to consider um, uh, different types of work, who might want to be um, and explore what it might be like to be an employee, those who want to kind of come in and they may be with us for all sorts of lengths of contracts. Um, but the recruitment space has been really important. And that isn't just about the openness and access, that's about, you know, we spend a lot of time giving detailed feedback. We might hear something in an interview from a freelancer and go okay you're not right for this but we're going to connect you with such and such and kind of opening out our network to them both here in london in the uk and also internationally we might encourage them to apply for other particular things we might speak to another organization about them um, and with their permission kind of connect them so there's something about you know breaking down i think um we'd spoken earlier about you know isolation and being in twos the whole thing about recognizing in the environment in which um, freelancers are often working in. And so there's something about recruitment that we've kind of really focused on and making that part of the process. And then there's something about um, uh, the nuts and bolts, the contracts, um, and how we can make them bespoke to a certain extent and how we can make them reflect the ways in which we want freelancers to kind of work with us. Um, and, you know, we have freelancers working with us through all our projects. They also, you know, freelancers sitting on our board. So all of that influence about the changing dynamic and space in which freelancers are working, both internationally, but also within the UK um, is a real influencer for us. And then I think um, that welcome uh, uh, um, in terms of the contract and being open to, you know, if you've got any things that you want to add to it, you know, even just that opener of saying, are there things that you feel that might be missing here? We're open to a conversation. And this sense that you're building a partnership together, there's an agreement that you're building and not a contract that is just um, transactional that you're kind of engaging and agreeing on. And I think that's really important in terms of moving away from this focus on labor to kind of humanity. Um, and similarly, you know, we've reviewed our fees um, a lot. It, you know, we work with some wildly different kind of ranges, but we spent some time and really helped by um, the fuels, uh, fuel theatres, um, uh, creative freelancers, the Re Shaping London's recovery, to really look at that and to look at how we can kind of encourage some of our freelancers to increase their fees, as well as kind of standardize, trying to standardize our fees um, uh, internally. And that's a kind of ongoing project. I think we haven't necessarily, you know, won, won that. Um, it's still kind of very much ongoing. And so once those kind of real basic things are kind of dealt with, or at least kind of you start the dance with a, with a freelancer, there's something for me about the welcome. And that welcome isn't just about, you know, it is about the induction. It's about making sure that they get to speak to every single member of the important member of their team, or um, if they're working with young people to get to meet those young people and create space for it. But it's also about how we publicly acknowledge those freelancers we make them part and parcel they are on our website their biogs everyone gets to read their whole history i really enjoy that bit of like once i've interviewed someone and given them a, a job i'm like right i'm gonna write your biog for you because we're gonna i'm gonna be your wingman and so you know this idea of sharing that amongst the team so that there's a real instant recognition of the expertise that that person brings to the table and that that, that is part of the welcome you know they don't have to come in and explain themselves there is this real sense of 
um, a welcome and a joyousness that they're kind of joining us um, collectively. So that's kind of really important for me. You know, they're on the website, their biogs are shared, there's all this space created for this welcome. And this opportunity also to um, understand how we work. So we do introduce a lot of our freelancers into our structures and the way that we work. Um, and, and part of doing that is so that, you know, one of the things that I think really came across really clearly in um, during the pandemic and freelancers were kind of having conversations and, and, and letting us know how their experience with us was that so many have had really poor experiences in our organisations. And so for me, the idea of being able to be able to be really clear about how they can make complaints. How can they say, actually, this is not working for me <laughs> or, you know, so yeah, this idea of review points that can be positive, but also can be, yeah, there's an issue here. I want to kind of deal with that. And that that's something that is really welcomed and the space is created for that. Um, and, and that helps to kind of connect with the rest of the team because it's not just this one-on-one -on -one space of like, well, here you have a complaint, you know, and it's not quite a grievance, but actually that there, that there are some things that can get escalated in terms of the experiences that people have been talking about that can be little things that you just miss. And it's partly because, you know, we've all drunk the Kool-Aid, we're in the organisation, we're breathing the organisation, we're wearing the organisation's clothes, we're walking in the organisation path and we miss little things. So. For for me, it's really important that as part of that, you know, initial welcome, we're saying to people that tell us uh, this is a space where you can tell us this is a person you can go to if something isn't quite working out. And there's and that creates a sensitivity amongst the whole team about how we are inducting and inviting and working with people. And that enables us also, I think, for the fifth thing for me, which is around, you know, allowing freelancers ways of working to be present. So, you know, the idea that we've all been in this space of remote working and this idea that, OK, now you're going to kind of come into the office or you're going to work from home. You know, the, having a conversation that says, how would you like to work is really important, which allows us to then have a conversation that says, how can this freelancer's practice influence us um, and, and, and creating some space for that? And um, so, yeah, those are the ways in which we've kind of internally dealt with that and then externally um as part of the um creative freelancers shaping london's recovery we worked with a freelancer um gael um Lekornek, who was exploring with us and a couple of other organizations some bits around what would it look like if over the next few years part of that recovery was kind of driven by freelancers and that part of the challenge to the GLA from our little group and our research and our study was what if we did a kind of pilot of what a basic income would look like for creative freelancers in London. And so we spent some time exploring what that looked like, looking at other models in Italy and, and Ireland and all over, creating a model that might exist for London. So there's something about us internally making some changes, but also what then becomes our advocate role um, across the sector and how do we support freelancers to create some thinking space um, so for some shared learning. So that's been a real influencer for us, um, that particular programme and um, being able to work really closely and share ideas and um, knowledge and dissemination with 50 organisations and 50 freelancers has been really, really valuable. So that's kind of a little snapshot into where we've been. <laughs> um, and yeah, lots of and lots of echoes and and more besides i think which we'll get into later well i've got a real sense of journey there tom would you like to come in too yeah um not i mean so let's cover an awful lot of all the stuff we're doing in terms of freelance things i mean i'm a i've been a freelancer for a long time and um currently five months into a year and a half with lyft so um it's been a, a pleasure as general manager to to take those Things already put in place with uh, by Stella and the team, and and to extend that welcome to our, our freelance team for the festival. I mean, we we, we take on sixteen people uh, this year for the festival, so the team expands quite a lot, um, and it's really interesting. And um, it was it was a really great experience to come into this organisation and to observe sort of with fresh eyes the way that the organisation welcomes people. Um, 
for me personally, I feel like it's a really democratic organization. I feel like the company culture that Stella's created is really, really great in terms of the way that everyone speaks together as a team. Um, and just those little things uh, like, for example, when we're doing recruitment, we send the interview questions first. We make sure that, you know, the, the, that the access budget is there for people if they need um, extra things to, to attend the interview. Um, and the Lyft have done some things which I've never seen in other companies like, uh, you know, a mental health wellness check, you know, a sort of uh, a template which allows, you know, supervisors and, well, or whoever's looking after a particular freelancer um, at the beginning of their time to talk about what, how, how they work best, you know, day to day, what trigger signs there are, um, if they're overwhelmed or stressed or need some time. And, and that's all part of that welcome experience of, of making people feel a real part of the organisation. Um, also, um, Stella has been, uh, has put in place a, like a career development plan check in for people as they come into the organization. Uh, and there's, you know, always plans for like exit interviews to make sure that we're, you know, uh, starting and ending our journey with those people in the best way possible, making sure that we can take learning from anything they give us on the way at, on the, way at, the, at the end of their, their time with us. Um, I've, I've written lots of notes, but I feel like Stella contributed an awful lot. And I feel like I'd be doubling up on the things that she was saying. But. Definitely. Just wanted to add a couple of examples, Tom. So thank you for that. <laughs> I'd forgotten. Yeah, but they're really nice and practical. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm very much feeling the heart. Um, I really loved what you're saying around moving away from labour. And I'm reminded of we talk about resilience and sustainability as being kind of financial, organizational, and actually there is something about emotional resilience. Mm -hmm. And really putting that at the heart of organisations. Um, so thank you. I want to bring in Richard to tell us about um, the concrete things that we've changed in, in our practice that people make it work, including like shifting the leadership model and a commitment to a quality of power and influence. Um, so Richard, how has that been realised in practical ways? Thanks, Sandy. Um, can I just say how much I've loved this conversation so far. Honestly, the work that you're doing, Zana, Stella, Tom, is epic and I can, and it's hard, it's honest, it's authentic, it's full of heart, it's it's um, full of listening and it's got freelance futures like written in it, right? And when we've been thinking about freelance futures, we've been thinking actually what freelance humans need are some of the same things that employed humans need. And actually what, you know, perhaps um, freelance futures, uh, freelance humans might need, might include some of the things that disabled humans need or others who are marginalized. And of course you recognize the intersections that run across all of these communities. Um, and so I hear all of that in this conversation and it's um, wonderful and we're called People Make It Work and so we're really interested in creating cultures that enable people to thrive and we've heard some in this conversation. So I think we noticed that um, we've noticed that um, uh, that organisations, cultural organisations um, have a extraordinary missions and think often really um, holistically and constructively about audiences, participants and communities and think generously and think with heart and think with collaboration and think with listening when we're working with artists and participants and across spaces and places and yet when we go to contract someone to work with us, whether that's as a freelancer or an employee, we kind of adopt this other space often, which isn't as human-centered, and which is about um, some of the things that we've been reading in the chat. It's about kind of putting people in boxes, it's about control, it's about seeing potential employees as potential litigants, who might take us to court rather than potential transformers of our audiences and artistic program. 
And so we noticed that some organisations have kind of had a bias towards control in their HR practices, even as they have a bias towards empowerment in their creative practices. That's kind of one of the things we wanted to explore in this topic today. So talking really practically about people make it work, um, we have a, we, we absolutely focus on um, uh, starting conversations with potential employees by thinking about our culture, our mission, and the and how we want them to feel when they're working with us, and why they've chosen us, and why we've chosen them. And um, so that human-centered culture means that our, we have person-driven contracts. We start with a conversation, not a contract. What would you want in a contract if you were working with us? What would it need to say? What would, if you were looking at your ideal role in a newspaper today, what would it say in it? And how much of that could we incorporate in this work we're doing together? We imagine that people we're working with have infinite potential, um, are positively motivated, and that they're engaged in our mission. And our job's to enable, release, and fuel that, not to control and um, manage that. So we so the things we've done are change our contracts so that they're person centered. For instance, we offer unlimited unpaid leave so that individuals end up with a with um a essentially a zero hours contract with us rather than us with them. They choose as employees, they choose whether they when they work with us. We have a, a care package with a therapist in residence, a coach in residence, a researcher in residence, in case people want to explore new ideas, and a holistic practitioner in residence. And they're all free for everyone, freelance and employed, to access. We now have a director of care and support, a director of empowerment, and a head of belonging. Um, and their jobs are to enable all of us, freelancers and employees, to be our best selves, in our work and we have a peer learning program that um, everybody is involved in. So for me some of those shifts are about um, looking for ways to create parity of support and care for um, people regardless of the employment contract that they have with us. Um, in just the same way as during the COVID um, pandemic we made a commitment to cultural organizations and leaders in every employed and freelance that we would offer the support they needed regardless of the ability to pay and we made that promise to the sector during that time and freelancers that were working with us were some of the people that delivered that promise and then we made promises to our freelance colleagues that we would find ways to pay them if they needed money regardless of whether we had work for them to do and we made a commitment to be driven by our values rather than our contracts when we were having those conversations the last thing i'd say around sort of concrete changes is that we've offered freelancers that we work with often the opportunity if they want to to become um, permanent employees and we've in that conversation many people have said that isn't that that doesn't serve them and then we've had conversations about what might their freelance contract look like in ways that serve them better um, maybe that's thinking a little bit more about how we might support their development and growth for instance or support them with community so we see people make it work as a community of 60 freelancers. And I think that that C word is really, really important in this context. And for some in that community, that's more important than getting work from us. Um, yeah, so I think those things take us to sort of a, a concrete shift. You asked Sandy about, um, about changing the way we lead. So I'm the founder of People Make It Work and I set it up 22 years ago. And until recently, I was the chief exec and founder and the um, only employee. And um, now we have um, six directors. We're all paid the same money as each other. 
and um, we're all employed um, and we have we have a, a, um, an equality, a parity of uh, power and influence in the organisation. And of course, some of that involves me depowering, understanding where I might kind of steal power as founder. So we've got work to do to realise the intention of parity and not, rec not imagine that it's there already. But um, Sandeep Mahal is our Director of Sector Change. Vicky Bokwe is our Director of Empowerment. Um, Hilary is our Director of Care and Support. Um, I could go on, but we have a limited amount of time. Should I go back to you, Sandy? Thank you so much, Richard. I am hearing a common thread and, and theme, which is around involving freelancers to be able to listen and learn together um, and, and to affect and influence organisations through review points, through feedback, um, seems to be a, a common thread that I'm hearing there. Um, I'd like us to move on to the second theme of this conversation, and it's inspired really by um, uh, Freelance Futures partner, Migrants and Culture, and their research and artist, um, Dr. Deanna Damien Martin, who has written a blog which talks about some of the conditions and experiences of migrants, refugees, those with undocumented or precarious legal status and how they are most impacted um, by the government's hostile environment, but also by the very policies at play within cultural organisations. So creating unfair barriers um, to freelance uh, and other workers um, for migrants in culture. So I just wanted to invite Stella and, and Tom to talk a little bit about your refreshed approach that includes like streamlining um, your, your supportive and advocacy role navigating the UK system around visas and immigration and then perhaps Richard you could share some of those insights from Eva who sadly couldn't be with us for this uh, conversation which shows just how easy it is to be able to sponsor uh, migrants to, to, to work in the cultural sector. I mean, Tom, if it's OK, um, um, I'd like to kick off by saying we are by no means experts in this space. We've spent a long time, probably the last three or four years, learning loads from Migrant in Culture as a network of um, really invested um, activists and advocates. Um, and you know, part of that has been really understanding the landscape that exists for migrant workers um, in culture. Um, there is also migrant, um, migrants in theatre as well, I should say, as, um, uh, that have also been really influential in terms of just being able to map the landscape and, and what it looks like. Um, because it is, you know, there is, there's a invisibility and a hiddenness to the migrant experience within culture. Um, and so one of the first things I think for us has been really just just really looking and seeing what that what that looks like. And it's different for many people, even within our team, you know, our artistic director is a migrant worker from Canada and is in the team. And, you know, often we are dealing with um, visa issues, etc. Um, but there was something again about, you know, in this even more sharply um, during the pandemic that in 2020 uh, September was when Migrants in Culture released the results of their survey that was looking into the kind of hostile environment and that kind of gave a real sharp a sharp look I guess at um, how for migrants their the, the fact that their workplaces were unaware was kind of part of the pain and um, so uh, as well as there being this kind of this potential to be advocates and to sponsor and all of that other stuff I think where we are again falling down is recognizing that there is a world within a world um, even in our own locations and within our own workplaces that people are having really different experiences and if 37 percent of Londoners and I'm thinking of London because that's where Lyft operates in in this space um, are born outside the UK then there's a huge potential there um, and as you talked about a bit um, before Sandeep this kind of layered um, historical imbalance that is replicated within some of these structures so that you know a government like ours can create a hostile environment that can really um, uh, push people to the point of um, just wanting to leave 
um, and that's and that can be a policy. And so, what it's like for um, migrant workers within our sector to kind of exist within that space has the impacts that many of us will recognise in other marginalised situations. So, this idea of um, of um, you know, engaging with migrant workers and making sure that we pay them on time is something that's a real big deal for us at Lyft. Um, you know, we sometimes say it's 14 days, but it really isn't. It will be two or three, four days at maximum if we can if we can help it. This idea that, um, you know, visas are horribly expensive, um, even um, for visas that are applicable to our sector. So that global talent, the artist's visa, you know, you need to have £4,000 in your hand in order to support that. that and that's even before you start thinking about all of the hurdles that are involved and the barriers in the bureaucratic process so you know and tom will talk a little bit more about this in terms of what we're doing currently but you know we we made a commitment to support that process we are a permit free festival but we will help and signpost and ask other partners um particularly if a if a artist is touring with us we'll ask other partners either within the uk or internationally to kind of help and support and that's really practical that is often about writing making phone calls and pushing and getting some you know some of that soft influence wherever we can um to move things along um and and then i think there's something also about you know the legal strain of all of this you know so often we might have people on our board or in our networks who have legal expertise who are up for doing some you know um some some advocacy work in order to support that process so that's kind of at the at the point of view in which there is things to be done that relate to status but then i think one of the really interesting things that migrant in culture talked about was and the survey showed was how many people felt that they were racially profiled as part of that and um, who felt that they were facing discrimination in their day-to-day -day lives but also within their workplaces so again just coming back to this whole question of the intersectionality of it all and how you know we can all do something that isn't about sponsoring or you know we can all do something to make the environment better and sometimes that goes back to basics again the kind of everyday experience and making sure that those kind of historical imbalances and um uh, marginalized experiences are reduced by how we interact, by the things that we think about. Um, and that can be in our interpersonal relationships as well as organizationally, but they all count to kind of counteract this um, very deliberate um, hostile environment that many of our workers are, are um, engaging with every day and is impacting on their mental health and their ability to move forward in their lives. Um, so yeah, that's kind of, um, again, my non-practical approach, and I'm sure Tom is gonna give us some practicalities. <laughs> I mean, just in terms of the day-to-day -day of how we operate uh, as a, as a theatre festival, we, we're obviously encouraging a lot of uh, people to come from other countries to perform at Lyft. And so there's been a sense of having, having to look at the processes that we use and making sure that we apply those sort of same terms of welcome that we talked about in the first part to freelancers, to those artists. And that's, you know, a really lovely process to be a part of. Um, this year, we've we've um, decided to uh, start to do the visa applications for people, um, which is obviously a, a, a huge undertaking to to and quite an intrusive process to, to to extract a lot of information from those people and and to work with them to make sure that they that the process is as easy as possible when it is quite a difficult process and a very stressful one. But um, aside from the visas themselves, I mean, creating those welcome packs with my sort of theatre producer head on it has been, you know, a really joyful experience trying to make sure they're staying in somewhere that's really lovely and that they're personally welcome when they arrive in the city and making sure that they get a sort of, you know, a, a, that, that, that freelancer welcome that we talked about, making sure they feel like they're part of something when they arrive and that any sort of specific needs that they, they have when they get to London are, are discussed and they have a real person to talk to when they get there um, that, that can be... Um, you know, that is relatable to them and, and to make sure that they feel welcome here. Again, I, I feel like Stella talked very much about our, our philosophy of, of, of working with people, but I, 
that's just a couple of examples in terms of the practical side of getting people into this country. Thank you, Tom. Um, Richard, could you perhaps just um, build on that and share some of Eva's insights around um, overcoming some of those barriers? Thank you. Yeah, um, I think um, I just wanted to say something that relates to some of the questions in the chat too. So um, within Freelance Futures, um, this session is within a strand called Changing Organisations to Support Equitable Freelancer Conditions. And I'm noticing in the chat that some people are saying, you know, how, how can we move beyond a conversation about what organisations do? And so I'd say I'd love I'd love us to have that conversation on Mighty Networks and think about it, as Zana said, from a 360 degree perspective. Um, but particularly in this session, we wanted to be doing two things, giving organisations who are present and have signed up to Freelance Futures some insight about the breadth of options that they have for how they choose to work and help us all see that those are options that we're choosing. And um, for, to give other freelance cultural workers um, a sense of what they might start asking for that they that you aren't getting already from organisations that you might work with, um, recognising that you know there are there's a context that we're all working in. So I just wanted to say that. I then just wanted to take us back to yeah. I wanted to um, channel um, with all respect um, the barrister. Ava Dua, who was due to be with us and is in court this evening on an urgent human rights case. We're asking if we can find some time to have a one-to-one -one video with her, which we'll also BSL interpret and transcribe and put on the website alongside this resource once uh, Ava's out of court. Um, but so I'm going to do a really bad job of kind of reflecting a couple of the points that she was bringing to this conversation. Uh, first of all, I wanted to make one that relates to our first conversation about um, HR practices within our organisations and then talk a bit about the migrant experience. Um, Ava's um, professional um, work relates to both immigration law, um, human rights and the Equality Act and the way that that relates to employment law. So she's kind of exploring all of these areas. And when we were talking together about the idea of a human-centred um, approach to contracts and employment and employment conditions, um, I was expecting her to say, well, you know, you need a really legal approach to contracts and employment conditions as a lawyer who often works um, in employment tribunals. And in fact, she said the opposite. She said everybody that she's ever represented or many of the people that she's represented, um, have come angry at not being heard, not being supported, not being appreciated, and not being seen as an asset in the organisation, not having care around them, not being enabled by the organisation. And she said she wouldn't be able to bring an employment tribunal case against an organisation that had the kinds of practices that we've been hearing about today. She said it's a non it's a non-starter unless there's a you know really really agree, agree, I don't even know how to say that word really really horrible um, uh, violation in that employment contract. Um, so she said you know if as organisations we have got so much money to spend on and time thinking about how to be safe as employers, spend it on being a great place not on protecting yourself from litigation. And I thought that was a really great insight from a lawyer. Um, she did say, you might want to ask a lawyer to test your um, processes and procedures too. Fair, uh, fair comment and fair advert for her profession. So if I move to the second topic, which is around migration, um, and I suppose I wanted to recognise that when we're talking about migrant cultural workers, we're talking about a group of individuals who live outside the country who might be seeking to be creative humans here in, this, in the UK, and also those who've arrived in the UK and have a migrant or um, uh, a migrant status. They may be a refugee or they may have a human rights case um, that they're making 
um, to claim leave to remain. And um, uh, Eva wanted to make it really clear that since Brexit, it's become much, much easier for organisations in the UK to become sponsors and to um, invite or, uh, cultural workers to work in their organisation. It's, she, she described it as a really easy process and um, I think we might uh, perhaps with Migrants in Culture and Ava run some courses sometime soon to explore that um, and we'll let um, Freelance Futures participants know about those. Um, so um, and that and, and as I understood it from Eva that that sponsorship opportunity goes to allow an organisation to hire someone who's in the UK, who who isn't currently, um, uh, who's currently exploring their um, their legal status, as well as those who are outside the UK who might be being sponsored to arrive. And when you, when Ava was talking about that, she was comparing the experience of migrating into the into the UK through a refugee route. Um, to the experience of migrating into the UK through a sponsorship route. She was saying they, in this hostile environment, they're, ex they're extraordinarily different. And if you come in through a migrant route, then you might not have the right to work. You might um, be um, moved around the country. Um, you might be treated with um, some disdain. Um, you might um, be impoverished. and um, and uh, you might well have had a journey which is traumatic and expensive in lots of ways. Whereas if you've been sponsored into the UK, then you'll be coming into a job, you'll be paid to work in your chosen profession with all your skills, you'll probably arrive into a place and a community. And so she was really advocating for the potential of sponsorship as a way of creating more positive conditions for um, migrants in culture um, within our context. I don't suppose I've in any way done justice to um, Eva's insights and professional um, uh, advice, so do look up the video when, you've, when you hear it from her directly. But I hope that goes some way to sort of share some of the perspectives that I know she was really keen to share with us all. Thanks, Sandy. Thank you. And it that does relate to what um, Stella and Tom were saying as well, certainly in the work that they've done to map the landscape in building awareness and using the soft power um, to reduce like marginalised experiences and to invest the time, energy, resource to making the environment better. Um, Thank you so much. I, th I just want to do a quick follow up with each of you. Um, what is the one thing you've heard during this panel that you would like to reinforce? Sana. I guess the power of conversation, which I think has come through through all of us. It starts with a conversation. Um, and there's someone in chat who said something about um, freelance status and employed status. I think there's a conversation with the people you're working for to find out what's right for you and to work it out together. So yeah, for me, power of conversation. Thank you, Stella. Yeah, it's an interesting one. I think that for me, just listening to everything, I think that there is always a thing that can be done and it doesn't have to be a series of things. It's the smallest things because for me, what got me started was understanding that this was about basic things and that set off a chain. So it is about what's the basic things that can, can be implemented, um, easy or not. Thank you, Stella. Tom. Oh, I think maybe Tom's frozen on the screen. Richard, can we come to you? Thank you. Um, I think I'd say start with, uh, stay with, end with mission. Um, because I think it tells us everything that we need to know. Um, so yeah, that would be my message. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Tom, you're back. You froze there for a moment. Sorry. 
Sorry, everything went black. Um, uh, the thing that I took from that was, um, it stood, stood out to me, something Richard said when he was um, talking about contracting, which is about um, organisations that have a bias towards control in their HR practice. And that really made me think about the ways that we can reword things to make sure that the, the freelancers have um, a bigger say in, in the way the contracts are worded. Amazing. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, this recording will be online tomorrow. And of course, the transcription and the BSL interpretation will be embedded as part of it. I want to thank Andrew Howell and Abby Jones for enabling access today, to Stella, Tom, Zana and Richard for making this a spectacular conversation. Thank you. And uh, really look forward to seeing um, you all again in other sessions this week. Um, don't forget to encourage others, invite your ecosystems, uh, use the Freelance Features website to help create the change in the organisations you're in and work with. Thank you.